Well, Shabbat Shalom. Let's begin with a blessing on our Torah study. Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu, Melech HaAlam, Asher Kishanu, B'mitzvotav, V'tzavanu La'asok, B'divrei Torah. Blessed are you, Hashem, our God, ruler of the universe, who has sanctified us with commandments and commanded us to study words of Torah. And before we do the uh, Torah p- reading today, the parasha is uh, number 12. It's the last one of uh, Genesis, uh, Bereshit, right? And it's titled, He Lived. He Lived. Yet, it's going to be about Yaakov's death. Yet, it's taught, He Lived. Not just Yaakov's death, but also Yosef's death as well in this Torah portion. But if you think back, way back to Perasha number five, which was Hayah Sarah, that's Sarah's life. And she also dies in that Perasha as well. So I think there's a principle here that uh, when you are in relationship with God, you live. Death has no victory. And it goes all the way back, uh, you know, to the very beginning. And so that God brings life. And uh, he's the God of the living. He's still the God of Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. He's the God of the living. <clears throat> Genesis 47, verse 28, begins our reading. Yaakov lived in the land of Egypt 17 years. Thus Yaakov lived to be 147 years old. The time came when Yisrael was approaching death. So he called for his son Yosef and said to him, If you truly love me, please put your hand under my thigh and pledge that out of consideration for me, you will not bury me in Egypt. Rather, when I sleep with my fathers, you are to carry me out of Egypt and bury me where they are buried. He replied, I will do as you have said. He said, swear it to me. And he swore to him. Then Yisrael bowed down at the head of his bed. Chapter 48. A while later, someone told Yosef that his father was ill. He took with him his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. Yaakov was told, here comes your son Yosef. Yisrael gathered his strength and sat up in bed. Yaakov said to Yosef, El Shaddai appeared to me at Luz in the land of Canaan and blessed me, saying to me, I will make you fruitful and numerous. I will make of you a Group, congregation of peoples, and I will give this land to your descendants to possess forever. Now, your two sons who were born to you in the land of Egypt, before I came to you in Egypt, are mine. Ephraim and Manasseh will be as much mine as Reuben and Sheman are. The children born to you after them will be yours, but for purposes of inheritance, they are to be counted with their older brothers. Now as for me, when I came from Patan, Raquel died suddenly as we were traveling through the land of Canaan while we were still some distance from Ephrath. So I buried her there 
on the way to Ephraim, also known as Bethlehem. Then Yisrael noticed Joseph's sons and asked, Whose are these? Joseph answered his father, They are my sons, whom God has given me here. Yaakov replied, I want you to bring them here to me so that I can bless them. Now, Yisrael's eyes were dim with age so that he could not see. Yosef brought his sons near to him and he kissed them and embraced them. Yisrael said to Yosef, I never expected to see even you again. But God has allowed me to see your children too. Yosef brought them out from between his legs and prostrated himself on the ground. Then Yosef took them both, Ephraim in his right, in his right hand, toward Yisrael's left hand, and Manasseh in his left hand, toward Yisrael's right hand, and brought them near to him. But Yisrael put out his right hand and laid it on the head of the younger one, Ephraim, and put his left hand on the head of Manasseh. He intentionally crossed his hands, even though Manasseh was the firstborn. Then he blessed Yosef. The God in whose presence my fathers, Avraham and Yitzhak, lived. The God who has been my own shepherd all my life long to this day. The angel who has rescued me from all harm. Bless these boys. May they remember who I am. And what I stand for. And likewise, my fathers, Avraham and Yitzhak, who they were and what they stood for. And may they grow into teeming multitudes on the earth. When Yosef saw that his father was laying his right hand on Ephraim's head, it displeased him. And he lifted up his father's hand to remove it from Ephraim's head and place it instead on Manasseh's head. Joseph said to his father, Don't do it that way, my father, for this one is the firstborn. Put your right hand on his head. But his father refused and said, I know that, my son. I know it. <laughs> he too will become a people. And he too will be great. Nevertheless, his younger brother will be greater than he. And his descendants will grow into many nations. Then he added this blessing on them that day. Yisrael will speak of you in their own blessings by saying, May God make you like Ephraim and Manasseh. Then he put Ephraim ahead of Manasseh. Israel then said to Yosef, You see that I am dying, but God will be with you and will bring you back to the land of your ancestors. Moreover, I am giving to you a Shechem, more than to your brothers. I captured it from the Amori with my sword and bow. Chapter 49. Then Yaakov called for his sons and said, 
Gather to get yourselves together, and I will tell you what will happen to you in the Akhrit Hayamim, last days. Assemble yourselves and listen, sons of Yaakov. Pay attention to Yisrael, your father. Reuven, you are my firstborn. My strength, the first fruits of my manhood. Though superior in vigor and power, you are as unstable as water. So your superiority will end because you climbed into your father's bed and defiled it. He climbed onto my concubine's couch. Shimon and Levi are brothers, related by weapons of violence. Let me not enter their council. Let my honor not be connected with their people. For in their anger, they killed men. And at their whim, they maimed cattle. Cursed be their anger. For it has been fierce. Their fury. For it has been cruel. I will divide them in Yaakov. And scatter them in Yisrael. Yehuda. Your brothers will acknowledge you. Your hand will be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's sons will bow down before you. Yehuda is a lion's cub, my son. You stand over the prey. He crouches down and stretches like a lion, like a lioness who dares to provoke him. The scepter will not pass from Yehuda, nor the ruler's staff from between his legs, until he comes to whom obedience belongs, and it is he whom the people will obey. Tying his donkey to the vine, his donkey's colt to the choice grapevine, he washes his clothes in wine, his robes in the blood of grapes. His eyes will be darker than wine, his teeth whiter than milk. Zebulun will live at the seashore with ships anchoring along his coast in his border at Sidon. Yishakar is a strong donkey lying down in the sheep sheds. On seeing how good is settled life and how pleasant the country, he will bend his back to the burden and submit to forced labor. Dan will judge his people as one of the tribes of Yisrael. Dan will be a viper on the road, a horned snake in the path that bites the horse's heels so its rider falls off backward. I wait for your deliverance, Adonai. God, troop. A troop will troop on him, but he will troop on their heel. Asher's food is rich. He will provide food fit for a king. Naphtali is a doe set free that bears beautiful fawns. Yosef is a fruitful plant, a fruitful plant by a spring with branches climbing over the wall. The archers attacked him fiercely shooting at him and pressing him hard. But his bow remained taunt, and his arms were made nimble by the hands of the mighty one of Yaakov. From there, from the shepherd, the stone of Yisrael, by the God of your father who will help you, by El Shaddai who will bless you, 
with blessings from heaven above, blessings from the deep lying below, blessings from the breasts and the womb. The blessings of your father are more powerful than the blessings of my parents, extending to the farthest of the everlasting hills. They will be on the head of Yosef, on the brow of the prince among his brothers. Binyamin is a ravenous wolf. In the morning, devouring the prey. In the evening, still dividing the spoil. All these are the twelve tribes of Israel. And this is how their father spoke to them and blessed them, giving each his own individual blessing. Then he charged them as follows. I am to be gathered to my people. Bury me with my ancestors in the cave that is in the field of Ephron the Hitti, the cave in the field of Machpelah by Mamre, in the land of Canaan, which Avraham bought together with the field from Ephron the Hitti as a burial place belonging to him. There they buried Avraham and his wife Sarah, there they buried Yitzhak and his wife, Rivka. And there I buried Leah. The field and the cave in it, which is purchased from the sons of Chet. When Yaakov had finished charging his sons, he drew his legs up into the bed, breathed his last, and was gathered to his people. Chapter 50. Yosef fell on his father's face, wept over him, and kissed him. Then Yosef ordered the physicians in his service to embalm his father. So the physicians embalmed Yisrael. Forty days were spent at this the normal amount of time for embalming. Then the Egyptians mourned him for 70 days. When the period of mourning was over, Joseph addressed to the household of Pharaoh, I would like to ask a favor. Tell Pharaoh, my father had me swear an oath. He said, I am going to die. You are to bury me in my grave, which I dug for myself in the land of Canaan. Therefore, I beg you, let me go up and bury my father. I will return. Pharaoh responded, Go up and bury your father, as he made you swear. So Yosef went up to bury his father. With him went all Pharaoh's servants, the leaders of his household, and the leaders of the land of Egypt, along with the entire household of Yosef, his brothers, and his father's household. Only their little ones, their flocks, and their cattle did they leave in the land of Goshen. Moreover, there went up with him both chariots and horsemen. It was a very large caravan. When they arrived at the threshing floor in Atad, beyond the Yarden, they raised a loud and bitter lamentation, mourning for his father seven days. When the local inhabitants the Kenanani saw the mourning on the floor of Atad. They said, How bitterly the Egyptians are mourning. This is why the place was given the name Avel Mitzrayim, mourning of Egypt. 
there beyond the Jordan. His sons did to him as he had ordered them to do. They carried him into the land of Canaan and buried him in the cave in the field of Machpelah, which Avraham had bought along with the field as a burial place belonging to him from Ephron the Hitti by Mamre. Then, after burying his father, Yosef returned to Egypt. He, his brothers, and all who had gone up with him to bury his father. Realizing that their father was dead, Yosef's brothers said, Yosef may hate us now and pay us back in full for all the suffering we caused him. So they sent a message to Yosef, which said, Your father gave this order before he died. Say to Yosef, I beg you now, please forgive your brother's crime and wickedness in doing you harm. So now we beg of you, forgive the crime of the servants of the God of your father. Yosef wept when they spoke to him. And his brothers, too, came, prostrated themselves before him and said, Here, we are your slaves. But Yosef said to them, Don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You meant to do me harm, but God meant it for good, so that it would come about as it is today with many people's lives being saved. So don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. In this way, he comforted them, speaking kindly to them. Joseph continued living in Egypt, he and his father's household. Joseph lived 110 years. Joseph lived to see Ephraim's great grandchildren and the children of Manasseh. Manasseh's son Machir was born on Joseph's knees. Joseph said to his brothers, I am dying, but God will surely remember you and bring you up out of this land to the land which he swore to Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. Then Yosef took an oath from the sons of Yisrael. God will surely remember you, and you are to carry my bones up from here. So Yosef died at the age of 110, and they embalmed him and put him in a coffin in Egypt. And as this is the conclusion of the book of Bereshit, Genesis, we have this closing blessing. Chazak, chazak, veniz chazak. Be strong, be strong, and let us be strengthened. If you notice, at Genesis chapter 49, uh, look with me uh, at verse 10 and 11. This is part of the blessing that Yaakov gave to Yehuda. Uh, he said, the scepter will not pass from Yehuda." nor the ruler's staff from between his legs, until he comes to whom obedience belongs. And it is he whom the peoples will obey. 
tying his donkey to the vine, his donkey's colt to the choice grapevine, he washes his clothes in wine, his robe in the blood of grapes. His eyes will be darker than wine, his teeth whiter than milk. I have a few more words I want to say about this, but I wanted to focus on uh, a couple verses from John chapter 15 in this connection. The very first verse of John chapter 15 reads, I am the real vine, and my father is the gardener. And then, if we look later on in that chapter, verse 12 This is my command, that you keep on loving each other just as I have loved you. In fact, since this is a prophecy. Now, how do I know that this is a prophecy? Well, because back in Genesis 49, when Yaakov begins to bless his sons, he says to them, Gather yourselves together and I will tell you what will happen to you in the Akrit Hayamim, the last days. Assemble yourselves and listen, sons of Yaakov. Pay attention to Yisrael, your father. So we have these, this is not only blessings here, this is prophecy as well. And so we look at this section here, and in the context of John chapter 15, we have these beautiful words with Yeshua speaking. And uh, he says, beginning with verse 2, we've already read verse 1 of John chapter 15. Every branch which is part of me, but fails to bear fruit, he cuts off. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it may bear more fruit. Right now, because of the word which I have spoken to you, you are pruned. Stay united with me, as I will with you. For just as the branch can't put forth fruit by itself, apart from the vine, so you can't bear fruit apart from me. I am the vine, and you are the branches. Those who stay united with me, and I with them. Those who stay united with me, and I with them, are the ones who bear much fruit. Because apart from me, you can't do a thing. Unless a person remains united with me, he's thrown away like a branch and dries up. Such branches are gathered and thrown into the fire where they are burned up. If you remain united with me and my words with you, then ask whatever you want and it will happen for you. This is how my Father is glorified in your bearing much fruit. This is how you prove to be my Talmudin, my disciples, my followers. Just as my Father has loved me, I too have loved you. So stay in my love. If you keep my commands, you will stay in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commands and stay in his love. I have said this to you so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. This is my command, that you keep on loving each other just as I have loved you. No one has greater love than a person who lays down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I no longer call you slaves because a slave doesn't know what his master's about. But I have called you friends because everything I have heard from my father I have made known to you. You did not choose me. I chose you 
And I have commissioned you to go and bear fruit. Fruit that will last. So that whatever you ask from the Father in my name, he may give you. This is what I command you. Keep loving each other. So what we see here, this connection here with the blessing of Yosef to be fruitful, to be fruitful, and then connected with the grapevine of Judah, that, that blessing about the Messiah. This is messianic. This is talking about, it's talking in, uh, in verse 10 of Genesis 49 that the scepter will not pass from Yehuda, nor the ruler's staff from between his legs until he comes to whom obedience belongs. And it is he whom the people will obey. And this is exactly the thematic connection with John. Chapter 15. Um, and then we see the affirmation of that following here. Just, the connection is absolutely beautiful. Because we see the fear of Yosef's brothers. You know, they say, when when they see that their father is there, what if Joseph holds a grudge against us and pays us back for all the wrongs we did to him? So you see what their thinking is. This is 17 years after they've come into the land of Egypt. Yaakov was 130, and then he died at 147. 70 years God blessed him with 17 years. Thematic connection? How old was Joseph when he was sold by his brothers into slavery? He was 17 years old. So the 17 years that Yaakov loved and cared for his son, Joseph, are now repaid by Yosef to his father. In his last 17 years there in Egypt. But that's 17 years. And now he has died. And they're thinking grudge. That's their thinking. That's where their mind is. How do we know this was the furthest thing from Yosef's mind? He thought that he had already fully forgiven them. In fact, he had. But he thought that they understood that. And so he wept when he got the response. He wept. Part of the reason he wept is because he knew exactly what he had said to his father. And it didn't line up with their lie. He knew they were lying to him. He knew that Yaakov said no such thing to them. But it didn't matter. It didn't matter to him. He forgave them. He forgave them even this. Even this lie to his face. Even this lie about his father. And instead, he goes the extra mile of love to ally their fears. To, to comfort them. To emphasize to them clearly that he had Forgiven them. He acknowledges it. He says, you meant it for harm. But God brought good out of it. He has learned his lessons well from his father. And from the Ruch HaKodesh. 
And he's applied those. And so I think the theme of forgiveness is a very powerful one right here. Um, uh, two more points I'll make more briefly, uh, then we'll open it for questions. Uh, Tony Robinson, and if you have his um, on page 168, he compares the blessing that uh, Yaakov is giving to Yosef's two sons uh, with Esav and Yaakov. It's pretty interesting because uh, I'll just go down the list here real quick. Here's the connections. Isaac and Jacob were both old. Two sons approached both of them to receive a blessing. Both Isaac and Jacob could not see well. Both Isaac and Jacob asked who it was that had approached them. In both passages, the patriarch kissed the lad to be blessed. In both blessings, the younger son was placed before the older. In both passages, the younger was prophesied to be greater than the older. In both passages, someone feared retribution from the other. Genesis 27, 41 states that Esau harbored hatred against Yaakov. So likewise, in Genesis 50, verse 15, the brothers think that Yosef will harbor hatred against them. The same Hebrew word. Same root. So, we see the connection here. But, there's a big difference here as well, which brings that into play. And that's what uh, the point Tony is making. We, we compare and contrast to, to bring out and understand the meaning in Torah. So, this thematic analysis enables us to do that. Because, in a sense, there's like a role reversal here. Because it sounds like the brothers think Yosef is going to be like Esau. What a contrast. What a difference. But they were wrong. They were wrong. That's the difference. They were wrong. Yosef had forgiven them. And he continues to forgive them. And he acknowledges that the difference the difference is relationship with the Creator, relationship with the Father, relationship with God. It makes all the difference because it enables a person to forgive like God forgives. And it should take us all the way back or forward, depending upon where your mind is right now, to the parable <laughs> of the unfaithful servant who would not forgive his brother after he had been forgiven an enormous debt. We looked at this uh, before Yom Kippur, Matthew 18, the end of Matthew 18. And... There, God affirms that you will not be forgiven unless you forgive your brother from your heart. So that becomes a condition from God for forgiveness. It's our own capacity to respond in kind. God forgives us. He forgives us an, a, a debt, an amount that could, could never be atoned for. It was beyond anyone's capability. And yet, we have the capability to forgive others, our brothers. And it is within our capability to do that. And so that's what God calls upon us to do as well. Okay. So again... 
Tony, that's the second point, Tony also comes back to this theme of forgiveness. Okay? And uh, I guess the, 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 the final point I just want to reemphasize, I already made this point as well, is that this is the first time in Scripture that the latter days are mentioned. Now, many of us in, uh, raised in Christendom, uh, especially if you use translation, which was my favorite translation through most of my adult years, was uh, the New American Standard Version, which is a very poor translation of this particular verse. You don't get any hint that this is, that this is a prophecy of the future, of the future. This, of the latter days, of the last days, of the Akrit Hayamim. But that's what it is. And so we have that marker at the very beginning of these uh, blessings in uh, Genesis chapter 49. And so once again, we need to, as Yaakov said to his sons, we also need to pay attention. To what Yisrael is saying. Okay. So, uh, I think, yes. I'm glad you made that connection in Matthew 18. Thank you. Matthew 18 about forgiveness from the heart. Uh, I noticed that in our passage you were reading in... um, Genesis 50 at the end when Joseph is reassuring his brothers that he harbors no grudge. Uh, It affirms uh, that by saying Joseph spoke kindly to their hearts, meaning he, he too was speaking forgiveness to their hearts. And maybe you could say a little bit more about that Forgiveness, because it comes not just from words, but it's communication from our hearts, too. Excellent point. Thank you. That's a great point. Uh, That's a wonderful point that it's making there. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. What? How's it said? It says, uh, yeah. So don't be afraid. I'll provide for you and your little ones. In this way, he comforted them, speaking kindly to them. Yeah, so. Okay. Oh, wait. Let's hold a second. We need the, the, the mic. And, and Kevin has it right now. You'll get it next. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I just wanted to com- comment and then question about a thematic analysis. And that is on that scripture 2910, I was looking up the actual word is Shiloh. Um, rather than tribute, or in this, in my version, it says tribute, but the one it says um, to whom it belongs, they've traded it to, they've called it Shiloh, which is peace. Which um, I was, we, my wife and I were talking, and it's, I find it interesting. I could see this scripture not looking at it as a, if you look at a Christian standpoint, I could see that argument for um, Judah's scepter has been passed because Jesus, Jesus has already come. Like, do you know what I'm saying? And so I could almost see where people could see that the same error they made in thinking he was coming to be king, we are making the same error, only he didn't come to bring peace then. He's coming later to bring peace. Just that was a thought. And then the other thing was is the, the, the coffin that the Bible uses, that your translation uses, is actually the same Hebrew word, for describing the Ark of the Covenant. And so, literally, does that is there a thematic connection there, as in they carried his bones with the Ark of the Covenant? Are they both Ark of the Covenants? And what would that thematic connection be? Because I just read that yesterday, but didn't have time to expand on it. Okay. I, that, could you repeat that last, that okay. last point? Yes. So, the word coffin... The Hebrew word, and I, I'd have to look it up again, is the same word used to call the Ark of the Covenant. 
they didn't call it a coffin. They didn't use the word that they would would have used for a burial. They used the actual word Ark of the Covenant that they used to describe the Ark of the Covenant. So in essence, the two would be the, he's, that is to me saying that the two are the same. So if they're two Arks of the Covenant in essence, and is that a thematic connection? Ah, thank you. That's interesting. Well, well, I'll let you clarify your point after she so. I was, I was, as I was reading the, the, that at home, I noticed uh, the brothers, didn't they actually make that up? I mean, didn't, didn't, Israel didn't actually tell them to say that. You know, like when they said to Joseph, or Joseph, they said to him, uh, our father said that you are to, like, uh, take care of it, bless us or whatever, because out of their fear, weren't they being dishonest, actually, there? I mean, out of their fear? Uh, I think that's, you're exactly right. It's out of their fear. that, yeah. that they, Because they're thinking in terms of, they're thinking, they're placing their fears, their way of thinking upon Joseph, right? And so he says, ah, Obviously, Yosef has told their father all about what we did and how we did it and all that. Yosef forgave them before his father even came down. And he even told them not to argue amongst themselves when they returned to get their father in. And so I don't. I, I'm convinced, I could be wrong, but I'm convinced, that just that, especially by Joseph's response here, and the, also their culpability in this whole process, he didn't say a word. He didn't say a word to his father about that. He didn't give him all the sordid details that you might, if you were trying to unburden yourself because of all the anger and things. I mean, that people do that. You know, I, you know, and I've done that myself. And, I, and I'll, 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 I'll thank somebody for letting me vent. Uh, it was good to get that off my chest, you know. Yosef was way beyond that. He was way beyond that because... He had already dealt with that and resolved it. And he tested. Yes, he tested his brothers. And thanks to Judah, they passed the test. Because Judah passed the test. Because he was willing to give his life for Benjamin. Right? Okay. So, so and also, that's also... Why I believe the mantle of leadership came to Yehuda as well. So, so whatever. Okay, one more comment, and then we got to wrap up. Okay, then okay. I'm going to comment and comment. A uh, comment or question uh, or clarification. I whatever just want you to want comment. To call how you made a great point about Joseph and his forgiveness and the love and all that, but I took it down to a more even practical uh, level, such as the five love languages. I don't know what they all are. I just know doing is one of them because it's mine. <laughs> and he did everything for them for 17 years, and they still didn't get it. It was like, that was love. He provided every little thing that they needed. Okay, now about the ark. I read it that uh, Moses was put in an ark into the Nile, and then, you know, she found him, blah, blah, blah. That the ark was, mis was actually coffin, not that coffin was ark. <laughs> the, word that, the word that they used for Moses in the ark was a different word than they used here. They used A-R-O-N. I might pronounce it wrong, but it sounds like it looks like Aaron, but it's the Hebrew word. It was only used exclusively for the Ark of the Covenant, and then they used it to describe his coffin rather than using the word coffin. Do you understand what I mean? Ah, very good. Thank you. That helps me, too. Okay, good. So, great. That's fantastic. So, that's not an argument then, right? You're, you still love each other, and that's a good thing? Okay. 
All right. <laughs> oh, one more comment. And I just wanted to add <clears throat> that through the forgiveness and through the reconciliation there, the, the biggest verse is he says, you meant it for harm, but God meant it for good. And I was able to save all these lives. And so I think it really brings the verse. Huh? Yeah, but it really brings the verse that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. He knew that he could forgive so easily because God had a plan. And throughout all of these patriarchs, the lesson is that it's not what we're building, it's what God's building and what he's doing and his plan in our life. So when we recognize that, no matter the circumstance, he's in control. Amen, amen, thank you. Great place to end. Thank you. Good.